Parthipendra's surprise when he saw the prince in the boat is indescribable. Isn't it like the prostrate deity came across and gave Darshan and said ask for the required boons? However, what is the reason for him coming alone in a boat like this? What happened to the ships of the destroyers? Not knowing that this is his ship, perhaps he is thinking that this is the ship that came to imprison him? It soon became clear that he did not come with wrong intentions. When the prince got from the boat to the ship, without waiting for Parthibendran to listen, he gave a brief account of the events that had transpired. He said, Vandiyathevan has arrived in a ship owned by an Arab. We must escape him somehow. The prince's news made Parthibendra very happy. All is well done, said he, and it would have been better if the rascal had not acted so nervously. But he must not be betrayed to the foreigners. The ship cannot have gone far, it may be chased anyway. Then he called Kalapati and told him the details. What's the matter with that? If the wind's blowing so favorably we'll catch it by evening. Where's that ship going to go in spite of us? To go a mile and a half and then coast by herself. Said Kalapati. But Lord Vayabhava was different. The incoming wind speed was decreasing. By the time the peak was reached, the wind had stopped. The sea was calm without waves. There was an indescribable gloom. Lord Surya appeared as a torch in the sky and showered fire on the sea. If you touch the sea water, you will not see it. Yet when looking at the sea, the water does not appear to be an ocean, it looked like a sea of well-boiled and smoky oil. A sea of molten fire was also seen where the sun's rays were directly reflected. The ship did not move, all mats were well spread from the sails. What's the point? As the sound of the waves stopped, so did the sound of the flapping sails. There is no creaking noise when sails, masts and transoms move. Not even the sound of a ship tearing through the sea. In fact the silence was excruciatingly painful. Also, the pain of Vandiyadeva in the heart of the prince is also great. The wind has stopped like this and the ship has stopped. How long will it be like this? When will the wind come again? Will the ship escape and go away? He asked worriedly. Parthipendra looked at Nava's hero. Then Kalapati said, the wind cannot remain calm like this for a long time. A whirlwind is forming somewhere. Soon it will come and hit us, or even if it leaves us and goes beyond, it will go away. Whether the whirlwind hits us or not, the sea will soon become turbulent. Isn't it so peaceful now? Today. We shall see the mountain-like waves rise and crash into the night, we shall see the mountains, we shall see the underworld. He said. Aren't you in danger of a hurricane hitting the ship? Ordinary danger? Only if God saves. Then we shall hardly catch that ship. Prince. The sea and the wind are not partial. That ship would have suffered the same fate as we have. For now it too would stand motionless. Perhaps if it had gone ashore? Asked the prince. If it had gone ashore, its occupants could have disembarked and run ashore. But the ship is gone. Kalapati said. No matter how great the danger, we don't care if the people we need are on our side. Said the prince. Vandiyadeva's smiling face and Fungajali's grim-eyed face often came before his mind's eye. Where are they now? What are they doing? What are they thinking? Let us now go to Vandiyadeva, whom we had left in a state of real danger. He lay tied to a log in a dark room, where pallets, logs, and bundles of wood were piled up at the base of the great log that had come to carry the prince captive. For a long time he looked delirious. He was tormented by the thought that he might be caught in such a predicament due to hasty intelligence. What is this ship, whose ship is it? how some rogue Arabs and magician Ravi Dasan have joined it, where this ship is going and what they will do to him, he does not understand anything. All the dreams he had about his future seemed like dreams in reality. When he had escaped from all the hardships greater than this, there were times when there was a possibility that there would be no way out. By, as long as there is life in the body, as long as there is knowledge and counsel, there is no need to lose faith at all. After this desire appeared, he looked around. 
At first the eye is invisible in the dark. It was known to come. He saw various weapons piled up near him. His body was bound, but his hands were not. Loosen the handcuffs and reach out one hand to pick up one of the knives lying there, the ropes that bind the body and legs can be cut. But then what? The door to this room is locked. How to get out of this? After leaving, could he fight with so many Arabs as with the magician and his companion? After fighting like that and killing everyone, then what do you do? Can he steer the ship by himself? He doesn't know anything about ship etiquette. Yes, don't rush again, have to wait and see. Doesn't the fact that they tied him up without trying to kill him right away leave some room for hope? What are they going to do, see? But in time, Vandiyadeva's patience was severely tested. The room was so stuffy that it was as if he was being boiled in an oven. The body was covered in sweat. He never dreamed that a sea voyage would be so hot. He remembered the boat ride that night with Pungazali. How did the cold wind blow? How heartbroken the body was. What is the difference between that and this? It's called putting lime in the gutter, isn't it? Suddenly he felt something change. Yes, the game has stopped on the ship. The ship seemed to stand motionless. The swelling got worse. Thirsty and dry tongue and throat. What can't wait much longer? All you have to do is pick up the knife, cut the bandages and go and see. Do they have drinking water somewhere on board? the van looked around. There were some coconuts lying in a corner. Aha! I cried for ghee to be butter. Can you satisfy both hunger and thirst with those coconuts? Vandiyadeva loosened the handcuffs and left them. He reached out to take out the knife. Just then, I heard footsteps. I heard the sound of the door opening. He folded the outstretched hand. The magician Ravidasan and his companion, who had come and gone the previous time, came in. Both stood on either side of Vandiyathevan. How was the cruise, Dad? Are you all right? Ravidasan asked. Vandiyathevan said, Thirst kills, some water. Unable to speak, he spoke. Ah! We are thirsty too. Didn't those sinners put water on board? said Ravi Dasan. Kali is more thirsty than anyone else. Bloodthirsty, said another. Vandiyadeva turned and stared at him. Don't you remember me, brother? Have you forgotten? Did Devaralan come to the Kadampur palace after the Kuravakut and played a frenzy? Kalatai is asking for sacrifice. She is asking for the blood of the royal family for a thousand years? Did he come in a rage? Ah! Now I remember. You are that god. Vandiyadeva muttered. Yes, it is me. We came to Sri Lanka to sacrifice a thousand-year-old prince to Kali, but that was not possible. We tried to send that Veer Vaishnava to Vakanda and that was not possible either. Have you come to Valu? I am very happy. For now, Kali must be satisfied with the blood of the Kurunila king's clan," said Devaralan. Then why are you delaying? Vandiyathevan asked. Shall we sacrifice you, brave youth, where you are found? After reaching the shore, should we call all the priests and celebrate the festival? Shouldn't the priestess come first? Who is the priestess? Don't you know who it is? It's Isla Iarani of Pavuvur. Vandiyadeva thought for a while and said, If you really have such a mind, give me some water immediately. Otherwise I will die of thirst right here. He said. No water, brother. Are you a wizard? You said well. Look, I've cast the spell. Now the ship stands still, don't you see? There's going to be a whirlwind by nightfall. And rain. What good is it to me if it rains? You'll be on top. I'm here. You can come to the top plate too. Stick out your tongue and drink some water to quench your thirst. If you'll listen to us. What are you saying? We tell you to sacrifice those Arabian devils to Samadra Rajan. Why? 
They say we should take this ship to Kalinga country. We want to disembark at Kadakare or Nagapatanam. Six of them, and great rogues at that. Three of them are sleeping, the other three are sleeping. If we three have finished the work of the three sleeping ones, then three of them can deal with it. Vandiyathevan was idle. What are you saying, brother? If you agree to our idea, we will untie you. The prince's face came to Vandiyadeva's mind's eye. Yes, he will not admit this. He will never agree to kill those who sleep. I can't, it's rude to attack and kill sleeping people. Fool! These Arabs attacked and killed the Chola sailors while they were sleeping. Why should I do the same if others do something despicable? Okay, your choice! said Ravi Dasan. He picked up a sharp blade from a pile of weapons lying nearby. Devarolano took a small rod like a plunger with an iron ring attached to the tip. Both went from there. But the door of the room was reached and the sheet was not put outside. As soon as they left, Vandiyadeva stretched out his hand and took a knife and cut the ropes that bound him. Jumping up, he picked up a coconut lying in the corner and broke it. He left the water in his mouth. He covered the remaining coconuts with a sack. Then he picked up a good sword fit for battle. He was ready to rush out at any moment. After a while I heard a sound like thud, thud twice. He learned that two bodies had been thrown into the sea. Immediately there was a terrible shout, a clash of hands, the sound of clashing knives, all from the top plate. Vandiyathevan rushed forward with a knife in his hand. Ravi Dasan, Devaralan, and four other Arabs were attacking and squeezing. The situation of the oppressed had reached a critical stage. Vandiyathevan shouted and ran away. One of the Arabs turned and attacked him. Vandiyadeva's blade struck the Arabian's blade and caused it to fall into the sea, he also caused a cut on the Arab's face. The Arab, with a terrible face covered in blood, raised his fist and came to stab Vandiyadeva in the chest. Vandiyathevan moved a little. The Arabian collapsed. A crossbar of the sail, dislodged by the speed of his fall, fell on his head. Vandiyathevan fought with another Arab for some time and pushed him into the sea. The sorcerer Ravi Dasan and Devaralan were not martial. So it was difficult for them to fight the two Arabs separately. By the time they were getting tired. At that moment the two Arabs heard the sound of something falling into the sea and looked back to see what was the fate of their companions. Ravi Dasan and Devaralan resolved them that it was the time. When everything was over, the three winners sat down to rest. Father! You came at a good time. How did you come? Ravi Dasan asked. It's like you cast some kind of spell. The shackles that bound me were untied by themselves. This knife came up in my hand. Vandiyathevan said. What made you thirsty? A coconut came over my head. It broke open and poured some fresh water into my mouth. Oko! You are so wicked! said Devaralan. They both fell down laughing. Brother! We tested you, and purposely loosened your bonds. We kept weapons at your sides, and placed coconuts for you to see. Said Ravi Dasan. Vandiyadeva could not know whether all these were false or true. He was a bit silent. Father! Think and say. Do you want to survive? Do you want to survive and see the face of your closest relative? Do you want to live by getting wealth, fortune, position, and title? If you want, say, join us. We can achieve so many benefits. Said Ravi Dasan. You killed sleeping men didn't you? Vandiyathevan asked. We only managed to kill two people. The other one woke up. If you had joined us earlier, it would have been a little easier. Killing those who are sleeping belong to what dharma? How dare you do such a thing? If you are afraid of this mustard, how can you swallow the big pumpkins? If you join us? With you, you mean with you? Who are you? Ravi Dasan looked at Devaralan and said, he doesn't need any secrets anymore. Either he has to join us or he has to be sacrificed to the sea. So let's tell him everything. 
he said. Say everything well, said Devaralan. Listen, brother. We are the valiant Pandya king's menaces, sworn to guard him. You couldn't do it. Aditha Karikalar won. How did he succeed? He succeeded because of the stupidity of a girl child. She had too much faith in the power of her passion. She believed that she could make the Chola snake dance by taking a picture. The snake danced by taking the picture. But it showed the power of its poisonous teeth in the middle. Our king's head rolled in dust. They took him to Tanjavur. They put his head on a palanquin and marched. Aha! Tanjavur! Tanjavur! Look at the fate of that city, brother. When he said this, Ravi Dasan's red, white eyes widened even more. His body trembled. The sound of rows of teeth grinding against each other was horrifying. God's appearance also became grotesque. What are you going to do about it now that it's gone? Can you revive the dead heroic Pandian? Vera Pandiar cannot be revived. Even my magic does not have that much power. But we will destroy the one who killed him and his people and take revenge for revenge. We will destroy the Chola clan snake class including the chicks. Will you join us? Tell me. After destroying the Chola clan? What will you do then? Whoever our queen tells us to crown, we will crown him. Who is the empress? Don't you know, brother? She's the one who's acting as Isla the Irani of Pavur now. Then for Madhurand Hagar. Is he a baby snake too? The waiter. Ah. You think we'll make that old man our king? To use his influence and money. Your majesty will be in his house. You guessed right? You're a good guesser. You said that the cause of Veerapandian's death was a girl. That is the queen of Palvur. She vowed to save Veerapandiyar, who was injured in the war. She did not fulfill that promise. We thought of burning her alive thinking that she had betrayed herself. As she also vowed to take revenge with us, we left her alive. Till today she is fulfilling her vow. Oh! We couldn't have done so much without her help. You haven't accomplished anything yet. Wait a minute, father. Keep watching. Said Ravi Dasan. He learned everything from us. He didn't say anything in response to what we asked. Said Devaralan. Brother. What do you say? Are you joining us? Who saw it? Maybe you will get lucky. You may even ascend to the heroic throne of South Tamil Nadu. What do you say? Some time ago Vandiyathevan said, Aha! I join you. He would have said that. But a three-day meeting with the prince had brought about a great change in his attitude. He was addicted to false cigars, contrived tricks. So wanting to change the subject, he asked, How did you get hold of this ship? How did you get in touch with the Arab who sent you to Yemen a little while ago? He asked. All my magic, father. We bought horses from them at Trichinamalet. With those horses we followed you back and forth. We saw the prince run down the field of elephant death. The old friends had captured this ship. The ship they had boarded had run aground near Mulith Island. They hid here and captured this ship. They asked us if we were coming to guide them along the coast. It was as if the fruit slipped and fell into the milk. How is that? We heard that Chola clan's young dragon was talking to the Chola general and we learned that he will return to the Chola country anyway. Not only that, brother. There is a dumb female goblin in Sri Lanka. That goblin was saving Arulmas Hivarman by casting a spell in response to our mantra. But for the Chola country, it was won't come. Vandiyathevan thought of all that had happened that night in Anuradhapuram. Ravi Dasan suddenly smiled. What is this laughter? What about? Vandiyathevan said. Nothing, brother. I thought of the nature of these Arabs, I laughed. Are they not such rude men? To kill men is to them like peeling a banana. But they have an inordinate admiration for horses. They drive the horses in the country with an iron shoe in their hoofs. 
we make the horses run barefoot. So we merciless, uncivilized beasts and evil men. It is a sin to sell horses to us. Do you know what happened this morning? Tell me. We all boarded the ship. We spread the sails and the ship started moving. Then the sound of a horse's footsteps was heard on the shore. That's all. They suspected that it might be one of their horses that had escaped from the shipwreck on Molai Island. One of them got off the ship and said he would come back. They sent us along with him. After. The horse is not caught. Brother. You are caught. See how well it has gone. How conveniently it has gone to solve the work of these horse lovers. Everything is fine, this child has not yet answered our question, Davarala reminded. I tell you, sir. I tell you, I am accepted to serve the poor. I will not join you one day. Do you belong to the servant corps? Have you sworn? That's not all. Then what's the hesitation? You are a warrior. You should join whichever party has the most advantage. Vandiyadevan did not tell them that he had a reason stronger than all vows to ally with the Cholas. Does he need any other reason to give life to the Chola clan than the eyes of Ilay Aprati and the smile of Molai? And then there is the incomparable friendship of the prince. Can a once befriended him change again? In any case, I will not join your murderous gang. Vandiyathevan said. Then prepare to sacrifice your life to Samadra Rajan. Said Ravi Dasan.